Hi, this is Tomasz Sieboda. I'm a partner at Innovo. We are a first choice venture capital fund for the most ambitious VC founders from Poland and the region. Today, I have a pleasure to talk to Zach Kolius, who is an ex-entrepreneur who successfully built and sold his startup Trigit. Zach is also a business angel and he runs his own fund. He invested in over 60 startups, including Truth Automation, Booksy, and most recently Clubhouse. I'm super excited to talk to him about how he employs poker strategy in business, how Polish entrepreneurs should approach him or other in business angels from Silicon Valley, how he knew about the Corona earlier than other investors or entrepreneurs, and what is the culture of Silicon Valley. Enjoy. Today we host Zach Kolius. Zach is a four-time entrepreneur. His last company, Tridgit, he founded in 2005 and ran until 2015 when he sold it to LinkedIn. He's also a business angel with over 60 investments. Hi, Zach. How's it going? Good to see you again. Good to see you. Zach, uh, I read recently your statement, which says uh, it's about Trigit. 10 years, seven pivots, a rocket ship ride from 1 million to 30 million in revenue in 18 months and a horrible, brutal ending at the hands of a partner betraying us. Can you el elaborate on this? Uh, yeah, so, I mean, Trigit was, wow, it's crazy. It was, it was a wild ride. Um, we started it when I was basically just out of college. Uh, my sister and I, and um, we had no idea what we were doing. Uh, we were we were smart enough to recognize that advertising in 2005 was really broken and needed needed to be fixed. And we were dumb enough to think that we had good answers to that problem at that time. Um, so we jumped into the space and then got really lucky. You know, we're able to raise money and kind of get enough traction to kind of keep the business going. But we really just sort of like. <laughs> We really worked hard to try to find product market fit. Um, and that's where the seven pivots come from. We were always in ad tech, but we were always different, different customers, different products, different focus. I mean, it was it was very much like, oh, that's not working. Let's try something else. Oh, that's working, but not well enough. Let's try something else. Um, and then we got lucky enough to get into what's known as real time bidding um, very early on in the programmatic space. So we were we were one of the first we got we started doing it when there was 20 million impressions a day globally transacted via RTB. There's now like 200 billion. I mean, it's so the growth has been insane since we, we got into it. But then because we didn't really know what we were doing, we got our ass totally handed to us by a bunch of more experienced entrepreneurs who raised more capital and beat us badly. Um, and we were one of the very first DSPs and very quickly we were in last place in a very crowded market. Um, and then um, we pivoted into basically providing um, dynamic creative retargeting on Facebook. So like you go to a website, you look at a hotel in Sao Paulo, April 5th, April 9th, and you know two seconds later, there's an ad in front of you saying, hey, here's a great deal on that hotel or another hotel in Sao Paulo on those dates. And we built really good technology and we were super focused. And um, yeah, we went from a million in revenue to 30 million in revenue in 18 months. And we had 300 million in, on the books. I mean, we were like, but then Facebook basically recognized that what we had built was actually really good and it worked really well. And it was very strategic to their business. Uh, they went to all of our customers and they were like, hey, you know how that partner we told you that we like Trigit? Yeah, fuck them, you're working with us now. And they just gutted us. I mean, it was it was painful, really, really brutal. Um, and so we uh, we we at that point I was exhausted and I didn't have an eighth pivot in me, and neither did the team. And so we we sold the business. And how you negotiate with you no know, one of the big tech companies? We did negotiate to buy the company. They told us they were going to buy the company, and then internally something happened and they changed their mind. They came back to me and they were like, hey, um, we don't want to buy the company, but we want you to come over and help run this. Uh, how about we give you, uh, 
many, many, many millions of dollars of Facebook shares, pre-IPO strike price. Uh, but you got to abandon your sister and your company and your investors, and you got to come work at Facebook. And I was like, no, I'm not doing that. Uh, that I'm, that's just not who I am. Um, and then, but then the second time around, uh, no, at that point, basically, they had made the decision that they really wanted to build the platform using the Facebook ad stack. And that would have just really taken all the technology we had built and and sort of throw it in the trash can and start over. And their their team and their engineers decided they really wanted to do that themselves. So, um, you know, the performance went down aggressively. Like we used to work with the biggest advertisers and they were so mad because performance dropped like 80 percent. I don't think they were wrong in this regard. They had to basically go back down to the base to figure out how to make it work on their platform so that they could bring their data to bear and their algorithms and their technology. And then if you've looked over the last five years or six, seven years since that happened, the performance has just been on a very steady climb out from that base. And they will, I think at this point, they might have be exceeding what we were doing. Um, if not now, they will in the future. So, you know, Short term, it sucked for us, but long term, I think strategically, it was right for them to rebuild it on their ad stack. What did you learn from it for your future businesses? If someone can change something on their end that fucks your business, you're, you're, you have a dependency. It's like, like building a house. And so when you build a house on top of something that can change, you're building a house on top of sand. That sand can shift and your house can fall over. You know, if I was going to come in as a late stage investor and look at a business built on top of Facebook or Google or whatever, I would say, look, you're built on top of them. Something could change next year. So I can't give you a 10 year multiple on your profits because in 10 years, you probably won't exist because they're going to change something. So I can give you a two year multiple, maybe or a one year. And so It, you're, when your equity valuation multiple goes down like that, you really just can't think about the equity value because it's just not there. It's all cash flow. Does it mean you wouldn't invest in such company or? No way. It's just, I mean, I would invest if you're going to give me a 12 month multiple, but like no one's going to sell me equity at a 12 month multiple because everyone has delusions of grandeur that the sand that they are built on is solid. So then literally, if you're an internal PM at Facebook, what do you do? You go and you look at all the companies that are built on top of Facebook. And you're like, let me find a good idea. And you're like, oh, these guys have a good idea. I'm going to steal that as the PM. I'm going to rebuild their product. I'm going to like then scoop up all that revenue and then I'm going to get promoted. The risk is very real. It's not 100 percent. It's not zero percent. It's different depending on the platform. Some platforms like Facebook, I wouldn't trust them as far as I can throw them. And they're very big, so I can't throw them at all. Other, com other companies like Twilio, who are designed to be a platform and all of their developers are on there depending on the platform, I would trust more. Um, but like, you know, it's, it's a balance. I read that you were four times enter, enter, entrepreneur. So Trigid was the first or the last one? The last. It was my fourth company. I stumbled into uh, one of the companies I had been advising was raising a round. And I was like, hey, guys, uh, you mind if I take like... 200K of this, it was a Series A, so it was a $15 million round. I was like, you mind if I take 200K and put it on AngelList and see if anybody will take it? And they were like, sure, go for it. So I put it up there and, you know, 24 hours later, we had filled it. And I was like, oh, look at that. I'm an investor. I mean, I, I had no idea what I was doing. Um, I don't claim I do still, but back then I definitely didn't. A couple months later, a similar thing happened with Cruz. Kyle was an old friend of mine, and I was like, hey, can I put up a little bit on AngelList? And he was like, sure, go for it. And so I, I ran it on AngelList. And then, you know, 12 months later, Cruz exited, and then everyone thought I knew what I was doing, and all this capital came flooding over, and suddenly I was an investor. And I, I've really, 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 really enjoyed the process of becoming an investor. Because the learning curve is incredible. Like you just learn so much every day. Like like right now, literally, there's like, I mean, I have a stack of books like this high right here of stuff that I'm learning. And the opportunity to like have these businesses where I'm deeply involved with, where I get to learn while they go through these very disparate sort of processes and like very disparate outcomes. And I get to learn through them. And so instead of just having a single thread, all of my energies on one thing, I've got... 60 threads. If I ever was to become an entrepreneur again, which I don't know, 
I, I don't know. I doubt it. Me, I don't know. It's hard to know. If I was ever to become an entrepreneur again, I'm going to be a better entrepreneur because of what I've gone through over the last five years. Uh, much better. Okay. I've learned so much. Can you describe something from, let's say, last month when you had the feeling with an, an entrepreneur? Before we started this call, before we started recording, I was telling you about this entrepreneur who I backed, um, who who raised all this money. And he's like a you know OG entrepreneur, and he's like been a director of product at a company that just went public for a gajillion dollars. And like he's like a huge pro, right? This spring, he told me he was uh, he was starting this company, and I was like, oh my god, let me give you money. The thing that's really impressive to me is the quality and type of people that he's brought to bear right before he needs them. So as the company is growing, he's able to recruit and train a team with really, really good timing. The level of perfection is just like, oh, I get it now. There's a, a nuance that you don't really get unless you see it. And so like watching this guy recruit his team and like bring it together and the way that that has really like been just, just professionally executed, I don't know. It's it's experience is a huge, huge part of it, obviously, like because you just can't do that without having done it many times before and knowing how to do it. It's also reputation. The people that are willing to work with him because of the reputation that he has is like world class. And because of that, the ease that he's able to execute it on, like he's able to make a couple calls and like very quickly get high quality people coming in the next day being like, hey, I want to work with you. Like that's a superpower. And I guess I'd like watching him do it, like, because when I was a practitioner in his shoes, I didn't have that level of credibility. So I didn't really understand how much of an advantage he has. So like, for instance, think about Stefan, right? So like mm -hmm. Stefan at Booksy now has a level of credibility where when he makes a call, people are excited to get the call. They're like, oh my God, Stefan's calling me. And then like, and then so they, like the level of quality of people that Stefan has been able to put together because of his reputation is amazing. Like everybody I meet on the Booksy team, I'm like, oh my God, these people are fucking brilliant. Like, and so especially, especially in Poland, like the, the Polish folks that come on board there are just amazing. There's a different dynamic, very different dynamic when you have that level of credibility. I talked to, to Stefan before our interview and he told me, that one of the great, great things which you have as investor is this empathy and understanding and being able to talk to founders. He told me also that before as, that you say a lot of the sto story about gladiators, if you could, you know, tell this story. The reason why I can talk to founders is that I, I've literally had the shit kicked out of me for 10 years straight at Trigit. And I deeply, deeply understand the other side of the coin. So, you know, when, a, when an entrepreneur goes to the board and they're like, hey, this is what we're doing. This is where we're at. This is how it's going. What the board, I think, often doesn't understand is that's the most polished representation of reality that they're ever going to get. And the other side is this is the brutality that is the job. So imagine, you know, you're watching the movie and, you know, Russell Crowe is in the basement of the, you know, the gladiator ring and it's him and a bunch of other really scared people who are about to die. And, you know, it's scary because you're about to get your guts ripped out by a fucking axe and you're you know, you're going to die. And you're like you, you, you know, everyone grabs whatever weapons are available and they shove you out in the middle. And like as an entrepreneur, it's kind of what happens is like you're you're kind of working on getting a company started and then you you go out in the middle and then literally you just fight and bleed and sweat and bleed some more and fight some more until you die or until you exit the company. And that could be decades, right? And it, it never ends. Like, like you, you know, you, you're just, every problem you solve, there's a bigger problem coming at you. So you beat one bad guy, they send two. You beat those two bad guys, they send four. You beat them and they start shooting arrows at you and there are tigers chasing you. And there's like, like it's an endless, endless problem set because in entrepreneurship, you rise to whatever the levels of your own personal incompetence are. So if you're Elon Musk, your personal incompetence is super high, but he still basically has almost gone bankrupt so many fucking times. Like, and it's just so hard. And, and you know, that's, I realized how, what that is. Cause I've, I've been beaten 
Like I'm like one of those dogs that cowers in the corner because of the, the evil owners. Like I, I've been that dog. And yeah. Is it always like this? Like, I mean, it's always an entrepreneurship similar to being a gladiator. Because, you know, from, I would say, Polish perspective, if you have this Elon Musk, you sometimes imagine that it's, let's say, easier for them. It's, it's not. Because the thing is, is that like every problem you solve creates a new set of problems. So like, like, think about it this way, is everything that's easy for you, you solve quickly. Like, that's easy, I solve it. So like, think about if you're Elon Musk, right? So like, like if Elon was to start a company, he would immediately have a billion dollars tomorrow. Now, he's got a billion dollars to spend. And when you have a billion dollars to spend, it's not like you can go slowly and take your time, you have to go really fast. Well, the problem is going really fast is really hard because you hire somebody and you don't know they're actually a cocaine addict and that they're actually like basically like on the side basically engaged in some other activity and they run all of your manufacturing and you're over here focused on something else because you're you know you got a billion dollars to spend and you got a, you got a lot of work to do and then you come back a month later and you realize that this person has done absolutely nothing and your whole company is about to collapse and but that actually happens all the time so like That what I like to say is that like in startups you have you have these problem in inversions. So think about like a good example is what I think of as a product market fit inversion, which is like you're building a product, you're trying to figure out how to get it to your customers, and you're talking to them, and they're like, no, 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 no. And then at some point it works, and they're like, oh my god, I want that. What happens is that everything at that point that used to be hard, revenue, customers, traction, becomes really easy because At global scale, once you have something that customers latch onto, suddenly all the customers in the world will want it. And so suddenly customers' revenue traction becomes really easy. You're like, oh great, I made it. No, 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 no. Because as soon as revenue, customers, and traction become easy, other things that used to be easy become hard. So customer service, that was easy when you had one customer. It gets really hard when you have a thousand. Um, sales, that's pretty easy if you're selling to one customer. It's really hard if you have a pipeline of 10,000 people because now you need a team of salespeople and some of them are gonna be idiots and some of them are gonna engage in stupid stuff and like you gotta manage all those people. Like managing your, your HR, well that's easy when your team is five people, but when you go to 50 people overnight, that becomes really hard. And so all these things that used to be easy become hard once you solve whatever hard thing you're working on. And it's just, that is a ladder. Each time you solve a hard problem, that makes that problem easy again, but it creates a whole bunch of new problems. And de depending on your competency, when you're Elon Musk, you solve a lot of problems really rapidly, but it just gets harder and harder and harder and harder. Like, it's the hardest game in the world. I read your sentence when I was doing the research, that entrepreneurship is the only job that as long as you get better, it gets harder. And um, and it, I realized that it, it really resonated with me, but it made me realize this and it's a tough realization. Yeah, like think about like, think about Mark Zuckerberg's job. I mean, how hard must that be? Like he's got, Donald fucking Trump on one side, like basically like he's got all of his employees who have all their own interests on another side. He's got core major technology problems throughout the organization. He's got fundamental strategic questions about privacy and around targeting and around revenue. He's got Apple over here basically changing IDFA. He's got Wall Street doing its own fucking thing over here. He's got like TikTok coming in from over there. And I mean, like, the, like, and, and, and he's got to manage, I mean, how many employees? 50,000, 100,000, I don't even know anymore. Like a lot of employees. And one of them, like when you have a big number of employees, one of them is doing something really evil and stupid today, right now. I read an interview of you, like from 10 years ago, where you said that playing poker helps in business. I used to play like semi-professional poker. And the good thing about poker is that the problem set is very small, right? It's 52 cards and, and the mental space is infinite because you have an infinite number of combinations. And it, one of the things that's really important to understand in business, and I think a lot of people get this wrong, is that um, the future is not certain. It's a probability set. And you have to like, you have to think about every choice you make and every potential outcome as a probability set. And you have to weigh those probabilities 
and understand that sometimes they go your way and sometimes they don't go your way. And you have to understand basically what you're gonna do on that basis. And the cool thing about poker is it gives you that experience of dealing with that on a rate like over and over and over again. Like you can, you can just constantly deal with what do I think the work future is gonna do? What's actually gonna happen? And how am I gonna keep my head in a situation both where I win and where I lose? And how do I maintain a strategy? And how do I execute that strategy in this challenging sort of environment? And so poker is a really, really good way to like constantly force yourself to learn. In the same way that chess is really useful for helping you think about sort of like, like multiple steps and then reaction and action with an opponent, um, poker is a really good at understanding probabilities. One more thing on selling your company, uh, because, you know, we said it's very difficult to run a business, um, but how is it to sell? Like, what's the feeling when you sell? Um, what do you do, you know, the day or the day after? And For me, it's probably one of the most powerful emotions of my life. I, I think a couple things, I mean, it's different for everybody. And it's like, one thing is, is that, in order to be an entrepreneur, you have to be incredibly focused. And that focus, in order to achieve that focus, it means you have to take, you both have to be aware of the context of the world around you. And then you have to like zone it out. You just have to ignore it. And, and so you create these conceptual frameworks that, that you, you keep in your head that are both very valuable, but they also basically create like curtains that prevent you from being distracted by other things. But those curtains can be good and also can be bad because they can they can make you blind and delusional to, to aspects of reality that are very real. And that's a natural creation in entrepreneurship. And the, the day we sold the company, those curtains fell for me. Like, and suddenly I saw the world for what it was. Not what I thought it was, but what it actually was, or, you know, that's not as best I could say. And it was a weird feeling. It was very weird. I was like, oh my God, like my delusions, delusions is a bad word, but my, my conceptualizations disappeared and it was like super powerful. Did you stay with the company for a long time after selling? I was let go uh, because they didn't need me and I wasn't going to add value. And, um, and I would have been a distraction. The problem is I'm an entrepreneur and in the same way that people love it when I just say lots of candid things and I'm like super open and I'm like, it, that, that doesn't work well inside of a big organization where I'm sort of a piece to a much larger puzzle because when you, the bigger the company gets, the more alignment becomes really important and the more like having everybody on the same page. And if you have someone like me who comes in and is like, no, that's retarded, that's stupid. Why are we doing that? Like, what's wrong with you people? That can be very disruptive. Now, sometimes that disruption can be useful and valuable, but oftentimes it's very, very distracting and it doesn't help the organization execute in the direction that it wants to go. When I spoke to Stefan, he told me that you were actually the first person to warn him because of coronavirus. Um, and he's like, and that was mega useful because basically you told him somewhere around January or February and they stopped recruiting at the time. And, you know, they had to do huge layoffs and it was really good that they didn't, you know, employ new people, so to say, just before. Um, and he said it was tremendous value. My question would be, how did you know? I sort of geek out over these things. Like I enjoy... When something like that starts to happen and it's new, I, like it's super exciting for me to like go learn about it. Like I'm like, oh, this is interesting. Um, and so I was, I was paying it. I started paying attention to coronavirus in December, um, and I knew when they shut down Wuhan, like when the Chinese shut down a city of 10 million people. I was like, oh, that, that's it. Like they, you, you don't do that. Like they didn't do that for for SARS. Like like you, you like you don't do that unless you are terrified of of what what you're seeing on the ground. When you see a discordance, like you know, in the Matrix, there's like a glitch. When you see a glitch in the world where you're like, this doesn't match up with this, that's always an indication to pay a lot of attention because usually it means somebody's lying. 
And when when the Chinese locked down the city of 10 million people, but then like the news was like, well, I don't know. They're, they're lying. Like it's clearly, and the Chinese have a reputation for lying. So like, you're like, oh, they're clearly lying here. Okay, pay attention. Um, and then and then when it got out, I think, I think I talked to Stefan in January and I think it had just gotten out of China and I think it had gotten to Iran. Uh, Iran was the, was, and I was like, dude, this is gonna go everywhere. Get ready, like, this is gonna be really bad. And because the epidemiologist, the best, most important thing to understand about epidemiology that I've learned over the last year, and I'm a total amateur, is they know from the very beginning at very broad strokes what's going to happen because they've tracked these over many, many instances. They, they, and, but the details, nobody knows what the details are. So it's like, like the, and, and, and one of the epidemiologists basically said early on, he's like, look, a respiratory virus you can't stop a respiratory virus. It's literally like trying to stop the wind. It can't be done. So we wouldn't slow it, but it, you can't stop it. And the problem is, is that on a global population, 30 to 70% of the global population is gonna get this fucking thing, no matter what we do. So we may get it down closer to 30%, or we may end up closer to 70%. And I told Stefan, I was like, dude, this is gonna be really bad. Today, so do you see some, you know, small waves today, which you are like, oh, this could be huge. I'm pretty convinced we're going to have political violence in America again. Like we haven't had that for a long time. It it's going to come back. When you look at like the history of like the troubles in Ireland and the UK, that was bad. I think this is going to be bad or worse. And I don't think when you look at what happened to that country and that economy and that culture and that society as a result of political violence is bad. Um, so yeah, I think that's, that's a no brainer. Um, I think, I think there's a very strong possibility that we look at some very significant inflation. Um, and I think a lot of people don't, don't understand how disruptive that is. Like it's easy to do the math on inflation be like, Oh, okay. But like, The details are horrible because for working people, like it's just excruciating. And like when you have those two things together, you have inflation and political violence. It's like really terrifying. Um, you know, I think a lot of these things are, are really interesting to me is like is you have like a statement of something that other people have said before. So like political violence. But like trying to wrap your head around the consequences of that is really difficult. It requires that like, you almost have to have an empathy for the potential pain and what that means. And I think a lot of people struggle to do that. Peter Thiel, he has this thing of saying, uh, you know, what thesis do you have that most of the people would disagree with you? And it's also on startups and something like this. Do you have something like this? I'm sort of a, a technological optimist. And so when I look at sort of the, the rate of change of technology, I'm pretty convinced that basically we're going to be we're going to see some amazing stuff coming out of technology and in both good and bad. Like, so, for instance, like if you look at like Moderna's like going after multiple sclerosis with their new um, mRNA, like that's just the beginning. That's super cool. If you look at energy, for instance, the trend lines on energy, like I think we're going to have more energy than we know what to do with. And we have to figure out like. How, we're gonna like literally energy is gonna be free large portions of the day. How do we deal with that? That could be a really fascinating problem. Um, I think if you look at VR, for instance, like VR is getting so good so rapidly, like in 10 years, it's gonna get almost real. Like you're gonna put on VR, it's gonna feel like almost real. Like you think about the quality of the television when you look at a really good TV right now, you're like, oh my God, imagine that in your eyes. Like we're gonna get to that. And when we get to that, it's really interesting is, is that like, Like the average American watches 40 hours of television a week. In a week, they watch 40 hours of TV. Crazy. Uh, when, and that's TV. When we give them VR that's that good, they're gone. And so like at the same time as we basically have like robotics and AI crushing a huge portion of the labor that's required to run an economy, like you don't need a factory worker anymore. Like the only reason why we have factory workers is they're currently cheaper than robots, but like those robots are getting so good so fast that like in 10 years, you factory workers are dumb. You don't need somebody picking 
strawberries anymore because like we're gonna have robots to do that like you don't need somebody planting trees anymore we don't need truck drivers anymore so the vast majority of jobs are going to disappear like they just don't need to be done by humans anymore because robots are going to be more efficient effective and cheaper they're not right now but they will be and so like I know. you've got this crazy sort of like dual vector where on one hand we have ai and vr that will suck in most of the population and they will never leave that and the other hand we have the no longer needing most of the population to do the physical labor that they're currently doing and then capitalism as a tool suddenly becomes like what does that even mean the next 20 30 years are going to be really weird most of people watching this are in poland um can you describe the culture how are things working in silicon valley normally it's very powerful because it's very dense so like for instance like i've gotten to personally know you know many of the founders of a lot of the biggest companies that you know not because like It's officially, I just meet them at things. I'll meet them at a poker game that we'll hang out at a dinner. We'll go skiing together. Like there's this constant sort of like very dense interweaving of people who are building interesting stuff here. And then, it, and then because of that, you build this really broad collection of relationships with a large number of talented people who have very different skills. So for instance, like if I wanted to start a company today, I could make a call. I could have a designer and an iOS engineer and a backend engineer and a marketer. I could have 25 people in this room who are my friends, who I know and who we've 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 exchanged favors and we and like I could make those calls and that's super powerful. Um, and so that then sort of creates this sort of capital that sits on top of it where those people create the Airbnbs and Dropboxes and you know Googles of the world and the capitalists are there to basically like provide capital and then to make money as a result but then that creates a feedback loop where I fund them they go build stuff it works the company gets really big they train a lot of young people the young people then go build something Then I fund them, they, and, like, and so the feedback loop is really big. It's world class. So like, you know, the best in the world get recruited and get paid to come here, um, whether they're starting a company or they're joining Facebook or Google or whatever. It's it's a constant sort of like, it's a constant competition. It's you constantly have to up your game if you want to play here. How crucial is is it for tech founders to move to? So, you know, San Francisco or Silicon Valley. I don't think a founder should move here um, once their company is going. So once you have your company going, I think moving here is a mistake. I think it's a distraction. I think it slows you down. You can do it, but it's hard. Um, uh, but before you start your company, and if you want to go be in the very fertile sort of like ecosystem and you've got years to spend building that network and years to like get to know people, then it's super powerful here. So um, if, you can, if you can get it off the ground someplace else, it's actually an advantage because the, you know, there's lots of really high quality talent in other places like in Poland, really, really, really smart people. And the, the, like, the, comp the, the other thing, the downside of basically the Bay Area is the competition is incredibly high. And so like keeping, recruiting, getting people is very hard because you got to be world class. Whereas you can be in other parts of the world and you can recruit really great people at, you know, without quite the same level of competition, same level of cost. So now the, I think, I think the real competitive advantage now is to build companies outside of the Bay Area and to find those really great people. But That's hard because you don't have the same density. And so you have to like, you have to build those networks in a less dense place, which is a difficult thing to do. But if you can do that, it's a huge competitive advantage. What would you advise to entrepreneurs from outside of Silicon Valley, let's say Poland? Um, how should they, you know, approach investors from Silicon Valley, angels? Ten years ago, most Bay Area investors, if you told them that they were going to have to invest outside the U.S., they would be like, oh, I don't want to do that. But now that's that's changing rapidly. Um, and now, you know, but it's later stage stuff. So like if you're like if you're an earlier stage in entrepreneur, getting Bay Area investors involved is is difficult because when I invest in an early stage company, I invest either in people I've known for a long time, 
Most of my network is in the Bay Area, so most of my early stage investments are here, or it's in spaces that I know really, really well, um, or it's because they have traction and it's starting to work and they've validated their idea and it's starting to take off. Um, and so it's like, those are difficult things to get if you're from outside the Bay Area. Um, you gotta kind of figure out how to get that traction and then you're gonna find Bay Area investors get involved. Um, in terms of reaching out, you know, at the end of the day, the, the easiest thing to do is just have metrics. Like if you email me and my email's in my, in my user manual, which is on my Twitter thing, um, if you email me with like metrics that are like, oh, here's our customers, here's our margin, here's our growth, I'm gonna be like, and it's good, I'm gonna be like, oh, <laughs> all right, let's talk. But I think a lot of people basically like, they think venture capital is about giving you the money to go get those metrics. And like, that's not true. Like you, you, the people who are gonna give you money to go get metrics are people who know and trust you. But people who don't know you, they're not gonna give you money to go get metrics. Like you really have to have the metrics. Um, Can you say more? What do you mean by the metrics? Let's say you're building a uh, an e-commerce platform to compete with Shopify, right? Super hard, I wouldn't suggest it, but let's say you're doing it. <laughs> Um, by metrics, what I mean is like, okay, show me uh, why yours is better. And don't just show me the product because I don't, I can't, I can't really differentiate. And what I mean by metrics is like, show me your customer acquisition. And so for instance, if your product is way better than Shopify, you should be able to call up e-commerce merchants and be like, look, my, my product is better than Shopify. And they should be like, oh, you're right. I'm switching today. Well, if that's true, you'll have sales metrics that will show that. You'll be like, oh, we had one customer last month. We have three customers this month and we've got nine customers in contract and we have 25 customers in the pipeline who said they want it. And then like, and oh, by the way, they're willing to pay us three times as much as they pay Shopify because our product is better. And now suddenly I'm like, oh, okay. Now that gives me enough of an indication that you really do have something that I could basically go do the research to figure out if it's real. Like, but if someone calls me up and they're like, my product is better than Shopify, fuck off. It's not, I'm sure it's not. Because 99.99% of the time, it's not. And I don't have the time to go through 10,000 different products that claim they're better than Shopify to like find the one that actually is better. Like, so you have to, like, I always like to say that ideas are worthless, but validated ideas are priceless. So you have to validate with evidence the claim that you're making, and then I'm happy to engage. I love it. I'll engage all day long if you have a validated idea. So if we took Shopify clients and every three attempts we take one or two, then that's, that's a definitely validation for you. Oh my God, yeah. Somebody's going to beat Shopify someday, somehow. Because at the end of the day, all, what I like to say is you have to be able to cold call a customer at nine o'clock at night on their cell phone while they're putting their kid to bed they answer the phone like oh what the fuck and you're like this is what i do in one sentence and then they have to respond with oh i want to talk to you tomorrow but so that means you have to have something that's so good that my pain is so high that i'm like like for instance if you cold called me and you're like zach i have a CRM system for single solo GP VCs that actually works and that isn't a bunch of work, I'd be like, okay, send me a link, I'll check it out tomorrow. Cause, cause I actually, that's a huge pain for me. And like, if you actually have a product, I'll look at it. And then tomorrow when you send it to me and I look at it, I gotta call you up and be like, okay, I wanna talk. And then I gotta be like, I wanna use it. Um, and then I gotta be like, I wanna become a customer. And so all of those validation points are proof that you basically have something that's really good. So let's just say you have an idea. It's just an idea. Well, what I mean is you have to be able to cold call a customer at nine o'clock at night and say, hey, I'm building this. So then like now you've put a higher barrier on yourself, which means because you're saying I'm building something, you don't even have anything. And then they have to be like, oh my God, I desperately need that. Let's talk tomorrow. And then they, so they have to be willing to give you their time and energy for something you don't even have yet because their pain is so high. And like in lots, in almost all of my businesses, that's the case is like, or the businesses I work with is like, you like there's, there's something that's so painful for them that they desperately want it, that they're willing to give you their time, their energy, their money to get you to do it. Um, 
And because in venture capital, the outcomes in this in this business, like the only because this is what I try to explain to entrepreneurs, they don't seem to get is I talk to these folks and I make an investment of millions of dollars after having talked to them for a relatively small number of hours. That means by definition, I have a high error rate. I'm going to be wrong a lot because I just haven't spent, you know, a year working on a million dollar investment. I've spent like a number of hours. When you have a high error rate, that means a high loss rate, which means your winners have to be that much bigger. So that means you have to have really big winners. Well, that means in order to be a big winner, you have to basically get really broad distribution, which means you have to have a really high delta relative to the competition, relative to the, all the other options for the customers, your product has to be that much better than what they have. So that's the bar is really high for venture capital to apply. But, you know, if you get there, I'll give you my money. Or not my money, my LP's money. Last question would be, you invested in Booksy, you probably some see some other companies from Poland. What would, you, what would be your advice to the Polish fun, founders? Like what they do... What, what they should emphasize or what they could do better? I haven't invested in another Polish company yet, but I'm looking and I'm hoping to if I can find one. Um, but it's, it's the same thing that I just said, really. It's like get traction, get traction, get traction. If you don't have traction, get validation. And basically, like, if you can basically say, this is what I do in one sentence, and then I can call up a customer that's a friend of mine and be like, hey, these guys do this. And then have that friend of mine be like, oh my God, I want to talk to them. Then I get really interested, but that's a really high bar. And a lot of people can't, can't break it down into one sentence. And they're still in the exploration phase. They're still trying to figure out what it is, what's product market fit look like? What's the thing that the customers really want? They're still kind of working on that problem, which is totally okay. But like, as an investor, I don't, that's not where I invest. The people who invest when you're looking for the answer are your friends, people who know you, people who trust you, or people who are like super experts in your space. Like, you know, if you call me up with an ad tech idea and I actually think it's good, which no ad tech ideas are good, but maybe, I mean, every now and then you call me up with an ad tech idea, I might invest in it just based on the idea, maybe. Thank you all for listening to the conversation. I hope this is of value for you. And it's a great moment to subscribe to the podcast and be part of the next episode. See you.